Welcome back everybody. Um, as you can see, this is going to be our third time solving this problem, but this is just looking at it in a different way, a little bit more simple way than we did prior, which is using the idea of energy, which we'll still be using the idea of energy, but we'll be skipping a lot of steps. So what the problem says is that a smooth at two kilogram collar is attached to a spring having a stiffness k equals three newtons per meter and an unstretched length of 0.75 meters. The collar is released from rest at A and determine its acceleration when h equals one. So this is going to be h actually. So this point right there and this point right here, this is going to be h. And what we're going to do is actually use the idea of the conservation of energy to solve this problem. So we're going to try to find the acceleration right when the color has moved from state 1 to state 2. And we're going to look at the different states of this system and treat it in terms of energy. So the very first thing I'm going to do is actually define this point right here. The point where the color reaches point C or the bottom as zero potential, meaning it has zero potential energy right when it hits point C. So before we go ahead, we have to know a few things about energy. Um, so I'm going to divide this up and say that the kinetic energy is defined as one half mv squared. We're going to define gravitational potential energy as mgh and we're going to define the spring energy spring potential energy as one half k x squared so these are just derived from using the idea of work onto a, a force such as a spring force and the idea of work energy principle derived from f equals ma is is where kinetic energy comes from and the same goes for gravitational potential energy so if we know these things we can define the initial states and final states. So we know for the state one that we have no kinetic energy because the collar starts from rest and it has no uh, potential energy in terms of the spring because the spring is unstretched at state one. So what we can say for that is that Ke1, I should probably change this to a darker color, Ke1 is actually zero. The kinetic energy is zero because the velocity is zero. And we could say that the spring's uh, potential energy is also zero. And then lastly is, um, is the gravitational potential energy, which is mgh. And we could say that is actually mgh because in, it is h distance from the zero point. So we could say that ug1, I should label these as s1 and g1, and say that this is mgh. Now for state two, um, we don't have any potential energy because we said at point C or the final state, state two, has zero potential energy by this line. So it has zero potential energy. It does have kinetic energy because it has accelerated from this point to state two. And the spring also has potential energy because the spring has stretched some distance from state one to state two. So we could say that Ke2 is one half mv final squared. We could say the spring's potential energy is one half k times delta x squared. And delta x is just how much the string has, uh, has stretched. And then we could say the gravitational potential energy is going to be zero. So now that we have that, we could use the idea of work the work energy principle and write out the conservation of energy. So what we could say is that the kinetic energy in the beginning plus the potential energy of the gravity in the beginning plus the potential energy of the spring in the beginning plus work done onto the collar equals the final kinetic energy, final potential energy of the uh, due to gravity, and then the final potential energy of the spring. And now we can actually simplify this because we already writ we've written um, down the the value for the initial and final states for all the potential energies and kinetic energies. So Ke1 is zero, so we can say this is zero. Us1 is also zero. Ug1, which is potential due to gravity, is not zero, it's mgh. Okay, the work done is done by external forces. So if we look at the force, uh, the forces acting on this, um, the only forces acting in the y direction is gravity, which is already accounted for by mgh, and the spring force, which is, is already accounted for as well in terms of the potential in the spring. Now the only other possible forces that could be acting on the collar 
is the idea of friction, but we, we're, we're going to say that the, the collar has no friction on it because we're going to say the rod or the pole is frictionless. So with that being said, there is no external forces acting on the, on the collar besides the spring force and the gravitational force, and those are already accounted for by these potentials over here, so therefore we can say that work is zero. And now we, we look at the second state, so we do have some value for Ke2, some value for the spring potential, but there's no value for the gravitational potential, so we could say this is zero. So once we have all that, we could just plug in what we have from the different states into this equation, and we're going to have something in terms of velocity. So we're going to say this is mgh equals one half mv final squared. I messed up right here. This should not be zero. This should be zero. I thought this was a uh, gravitational potential, but this is actually the spring's potential. So there is spring potential here. I just messed up here. So then this is going to be one half k delta x squared. So what I'm going to do now is actually isolate the final velocity because our goal is to find acceleration. And as we know, the time derivative of velocity is acceleration. So that's why I'm going to isolate velocity so that we could take the time derivative later. So we're going to isolate VF. So I'm going to leave it as vf squared because I don't want to deal with the square root when I take the derivative. So we're going to leave it like that. So our next goal is actually to define this, how much the spring has stretched, which we've done before already. So this shouldn't be too difficult. So the initial state of the spring is somewhere around here, which is going to be the length L, which is the unstretched length of the spring. And then some time later, the spring is going to be stretched to point C. So this is actually going to be defined by this right triangle. So this is going to be um, the right triangle and this is going to be H and this is going to be the square root of L squared plus H squared and this is going to be theta. So from that we could define delta x how much the spring has stretched by taking the difference from the hypotenuse and the side length L. So we could say that this is going to be L squared plus H squared minus L. So now we can plug this into our equation. So we're going to say VF squared is going to equal 2GH minus K over M times the square root of L squared plus H squared minus L all squared. So now that we have this equation, we have to recognize that to find the acceleration of the collar, we have to say that the time derivative of the final velocity is just the same thing as acceleration. And another thing to point out is that the time derivative of h is the same as the final velocity of the collar. And to explain that one, the collar moves down some distance h, so you really are representing or tagging this collar with respect to the vertical distance. So any change of the vertical distance is is going to correlate to how fast the collar is moving. So we could say the time derivative of h is just the velocity that the collar moves downward. So that's why we could say that the time derivative of h is just the velocity. And then just as before, we could define that the derivative of velocity squared, we have to use um, the idea of a chain rule. So we could say 2vf times vf dot. So the time derivative of velocity is just acceleration. So we could say 2 times vf times acceleration. So once we have that, we just have to plug this stuff into our equation and take the time derivative. Take the time derivative of vf squared. As we said before, that's just 2 vf times a. And then we could take the time derivative of this. This is going to be 2 h dot. h dot is just another way to say the time derivative of h. And then we have to take the derivative of this guy right here. So this is going to be the most difficult part because we're going to have to use the chain rule. And it, it might be a little bit com complicated because you have to, you know, be careful. So we're going to take, so that we're going to bring this constant out, k over m, and we're going to take the derivative of this part of the equation. So if we take the derivative of the outside function, that's going to be 2 times the square root of l squared plus h squared minus l. And then we have to take the derivative of this inside function. So that's going going to be 1 half times L squared plus H squared minus 1 half. And then we got to take the derivative of this inside function. So that's going to be 2 H times H dot. So again, this is going to be the most complicated part of this problem, the idea of taking the chain rule of this, this part of the equation. So you just got to remember what the chain rule is. So now that we have that, and we know that VF is the same as H dot, what we're going to do is divide by 2VF on both sides so we can isolate acceleration. 
So this is what you get when you isolate A. And if you plug in the values for the problem, so what we get when we plug in all these numbers, we get the acceleration equals 9.21 meters per second squared, which is consistent with the other methods that we have done with this problem. So I'm gonna quickly recap of what we just did. So what we did is actually define an initial state and final state so that we could use the idea of the conservation of energy or the work energy principle because there is also uh, the idea of work involved in that. But since there's no work being applied by um, some external forces, we can just say that's zero. So it's just the conservation of energy. So we look at the both uh, the first state and we recognize that the kinetic energy is zero. The potential of the spring is zero, but it does have some potential due to gravity because we defined our um, potential line down here. So it has some height h with it. So therefore, it does have potential in the beginning. And then we look at the final state and we say that it does have kinetic energy because it does acquire some speed from state one to state two. And then it does have some spring potential because from state one to state two, the spring stretches, therefore it has some potential within the spring. And then from state two, there's no gravitational potential because again, we define our potential line at the very bottom point C, and that's gonna be zero when it hits uh, state two. So no potential due to gravity in state two. And we recognize that work is also zero because there's no external forces acting on the collar besides the weight and the spring force. Since there's no external forces, we can say the work is equal to zero. And then we just apply the conservation of energy equation and recognize that all we have is the potential due to gravity equals the kinetic energy of the final state plus the potential energy of the spring in the final state. And then from there, we recognize that um, that we have to find the change in in the spring in terms of how much it's stretched. So we uh, use the idea of a right triangle to see how much it's stretched. So the only thing it was is that um, we, we found the difference between the hypotenuse and the side length, and that will give us how much the spring has stretched. So that'll be, that would equal this part right here, this delta x. And then after that, we plugged in delta x2 in our equation and isolated vf squared. And then we recognize that the time derivative velocity is just the acceleration of the collar, which is what we're looking for in this problem. And we also recognize that the time derivative of h is just the same thing as velocity. And we use this notation h dot to represent that. And then another thing we pointed out is that the time derivative of velocity squared, um, you have to use the idea of the chain rule. So what we get is two times velocity times v dot, which is just two times velocity times acceleration. So knowing these three th things, we uh, applied the time derivative to this equation up here, and this is what we get down here. So then we get two times VF times A, and all we did was isolate A by dividing by two and VF. So when we isolate A, we get this equation right here, and after that, all we did was plug in some values that we were given in the problem. And what we get is that the acceleration is 9.21 meters per second squared. And that's obviously going downward because state two defines finds a downward uh position or a lower position than state one so again the purpose of redoing this problem like two more times is that because we can apply different concepts to this problem we could use the idea of energy we could just simply isolate acceleration by using newton's second law or we could just um use the concept of s different energy states i know i said energy prior but i'm when i said energy before i meant the idea of using acceleration as the differential of um with respect to position so a equals v times dv dy or dx. Um, but in this problem, we use the idea of states and the conservation of energy. And uh, we just basically do the same thing, but we're jumping ahead a little bit because we know the different um, energies at each state. And then we just apply the conservation of energy and we just use that to find our acceleration. So the very first way we solve this problem is definitely the preferred way. And that's because there's less errors and it a lot it's a lot simpler, but not always a problem will give you such luxury so that's why I wanted to show you the different ways or different perspectives of actually solving this problem so it really is up to you how you want to solve this problem it doesn't really matter which one you choose but I would always suggest the one that's easier and less error prone so hopefully with these problems you guys fully understand the concept of energy and how it can be used to solve a problem with that being said I'll see you in the next video